Isn't it amazing how God can show up in the simplest way? I'd like to ask you to stand with me this morning. Just keep, just keep playing behind me just a little bit. Hallelujah. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 5. Trust me, that song will stick with you. Tomorrow you'll be in the supermarket reaching for mayonnaise and you'll be, send me your revival in this place. John chapter 5. When you got it, say amen. Chapter 5 of John, verse 1, and the Bible reads this way. It says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who had been there had been invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, he had learned that he had been in that condition for a long time, and he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid, invalid man replied, I have no one to help me in the pool. When the water is stirred, I am trying to get in, and someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at that once, the man was cured, and he picked his mat up and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to this man who had, who had been healed, it is a Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. And so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man said he had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped into the crowd that was there. And later on, catch this, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Father, bless the reading of your word this morning. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen. Come on, everybody said. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Just before we get into the message this morning, I, I, I just have to tell you this. I read this the other day, and I really liked it. It was, one, it was on a Sunday morning that a pastor had told his congregation that the church needed some extra money and asked the people to prayerfully to consider giving a little extra in the offering. And he said, whoever gives the most this morning will be able to pick out three hymns. And after the offering baskets were passed, the pastor had noticed that somebody had placed a $1,000 bill in the offering. And as any pastor would be excited when there's a need in the church, he was excited and he shared his joy with the congregation. And he said, I'd like to personally acknowledge the person who put this $1,000 bill in the basket. He says, if you're here this morning, and if, you're, if you don't mind, I'd like you to raise your hand. Because today, I want you to come and pick out three hymns. And in the back, there was an elderly woman, well into her 80s, that just raised her hand very humbly. And she, you know, raised her hand as acknowledging that she put the money in, and the pastor said, he said, ma'am, he said, would you come up? Would you come up? Would you mind coming up to the stage? And the little lady walked out, and she came up to the front, and the pastor asked her, you know, to give a, you know, a, a couple of words, and, uh, and she went on and shared, and, and the pastor looked at her, and he said, I want you to know that it is so wonderful, and my heart is filled with gratitude that you gave such a tremendous gift to the church today, and today you get to pick out three hymns, 
And the little lady, her eyes brightened up with joy. And she looked at the congregation and she says, I'll take him, him, and him. Are you hearing me? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now I think you're ready for the word of God this morning. You know, when I was in school, I remember a day when I was um, real mischievous. I don't know how many of you had mischievous days in school. Well, you know, I was one, I was in a class that was super, super boring. I had a super boring teacher. And it was just a real dull class. And so, you know, I, like any kid would, I saw a straw and I saw a napkin. And I decided to have, you know, shoot some spit wads at some friends in the class to wake them up. And I remember in this one particular time, there was a friend in front of me and I, I got a, a piece of napkin and put it in my mouth and put it in the straw and I aimed at the back of his head. And when I shot it, it missed. And it went right past his ear and the teacher was writing on the chalkboard and it splatted right on the chalkboard and erased part of her word. It was a juicy one. Are you hearing me? And I remember the teacher turning around, and as she turned around, she looked, and she already knew who the culprit was. She said, Mr. Gonzalez, get into the hallway, and I will see you in a few minutes. And I remember going in the hallway, and as I was in the hallway, as I was preparing this message, the Lord reminded me of my time in that hallway. I remember sitting down and, you know, the hallway, I saw open doors and closed doors. I, 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 I would see the door open and I was nervous because I thought like, man, I'm going to get really in a lot of trouble with my teacher. So I had friends in the class. So when the door would open, I would look at them and we'd be talking real fast. Is she mad at me? No, she's not mad. The door closes. Oh, man, I have to wait for someone else to come out again. And I remember being tortured in the hallway. I was thinking about, oh, my God, I, I was just in the dean's office last week. I can't afford to see him again. Are they going to call my parents? I, I was thinking of all these things. You know, I was reflecting on what I did. You know, when you're in the hallway, you're in between what you did and what you never did. You're, you're thinking about what's happening in your life. And as I was preparing this message, the Lord began to remind me. He says, you know, son, right now, you are in the hallway of transition. I have you in the hallway of transition. You're in between who you always have been and who you've never been. And there are people in the church today that find themselves in a similar place. You are in the hallway of life. Are you getting this feedback that I'm getting? Should I switch mics? Because this is really... One, two... Let me see this one here. One, two, one, two, one, one. One, one, two. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can you hear me? One, one, two. One, two. Strengthen this mic. Bring this microphone up. One, 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 two. Okay, this one, I'm going to use this one better. I'm sorry for that. But as, as, I was, as I was preparing this message, the Lord began to speak to me and say, you're in the hallway of life. You're in a, a transitional time of your life. The hallway is a place where there needs to be a shift that happens in our life. Because many of us, like we already had declared, we are sick of hovering at the same level. I don't know about you, but I, I need a breakthrough. I need, I need something that God is going to propel me into a place that I've never been in before. Are you hearing me? But in the hallway, you're waiting. In the hallway, sometimes you're forgotten about. You know, my teacher, she forgot I was in the hallway. Class was over, and I'm still sitting in the hallway. And she comes out. She goes, oh, Mr. Gonzalez. She goes, I thought you left already. You know, and I'm like, here I am waiting on her, and she forgot about me. Sometimes you're in the transitions of life and you feel like God has forgotten about you. You feel like people have forgotten about you. You feel like you're, you're, you don't even know what you're doing anymore. Are you hearing me? That's the way I ended last year. Last year ended for me like I was just in a place where I didn't want to start a new year. But then I had a friend that called me and he said, listen, he, go, he has a pastor. He's a pastor of a church in San Bernardino and the church has about 7,000 people. He's pastoring a mega church. 
and I go and speak there every quarter. And he called me up. He said, Mondo, he says, listen, you know that I very rarely would invite you just to come and attend a service. But I'm having a man of God come on Sunday night. And the Lord just told me that this man of God has something for you. And you should come out if you're available. And I said, man, I'm available. My schedule is clear. I will be there. Me and my wife, we went there. The preacher preached. And at the end of it, you know, it was a great service. We went into the green room. And when I walked in the green room, he looked at me. He's never met me, didn't know me, didn't know my name, didn't know what ministry I'm from, nothing. He looked at me and he says, God has a word for both of you. Stand right here. And God began to give me a word, and I felt the power of God fall upon my life at that moment. And when God began to fall upon me, it was a power that I'd never felt before in a way that I'd never felt it. And the only way I could describe it to you, it was though if somebody had walked through my body, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I felt a power that walked right through me. And that night when I went home, I began to ask the Lord, Lord, what was this experience that you gave me? What did I feel? And the Lord told me, that was me walking you through your barrier wall that you've been stuck behind for too long. He says, I just walked you through it, and now you're not facing it. You're on the other side of it. Oh, come on, clap your hands. If you need that type of breakthrough, you should clap a little louder. You see, it was in this time that God began to speak to my life and he began to show me the things. You know, it was that next morning that I woke up and God began to give me a word for our ministry. And He told me this. He told me this word. And I want to share this word with you because I believe it sets up this message that we're going to get into this morning. Is that the word was this, that the Lord says that 2020 is going to be the year of perfect vision. It's going to be the year of clarity of vision. It's going to be the year of supernatural focus. It's going to be the year that is going to explain everything we have been going through over the last several years. God is going to allow a supernatural focus to hit our life in 2020, and we are going to begin to see everything clearly that God has been doing. But in this time of transition... God has blurred, slightly blurred our vision because he is drawing us to himself. He doesn't want us to depend on somebody else. He wants us to depend on him. He's drawing us to himself because he wants to show you your original call. He wants to show us the original plan that he had because some of us have been chasing man's idea for our life, but God says, that hasn't been my idea. Are you hearing me? God says this. He, 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 when he spoke to me in this word, he says that I have drawn people to myself so that they will know what is the most important part of their future, which is going to be a genuine relationship with me. There are many things that I could share with you, but for the sake of time, I want you to understand this, that he said this, that in 2019 is a year of preparation. It is the year that God is preparing us. It is a year of waiting. It is a year of transition. It is a year of going through things. You're, you're in between what you've done, and you're trying to rely on what you've learned to get you to your next level. But God says it's not what you know that will take you where you've never been. It's what you don't know yet. So you've got to keep moving forward. The enemy knows the value of forward movement, so he is working overtime to get us stuck. You know, what we're reading here this morning, we're reading about a man who, in the Bible, let me just give you an idea of what this is, is that the Bible had this pool of Bethesda, which is translated as the pool of mercy. This was a time in the Word of God that there were not a lot of miracles happening through men. Was the prophets weren't there operating in the gifts of miracles at this time. So what the Lord did is he created a pool and he says this will be the place of miracles. And how it works is the, the Lord would send an angel down and he wouldn't come daily, he wouldn't come weekly or monthly, but he would come at strategic times. And he would stir the water and as he stirred the water of the pool, whoever would jump in first would experience a miracle for their life and a healing in their life. And in this time, the Lord comes across this man 
who has been laying next to the pool for 38 years. He's a man that has gotten somehow in his life he set out one morning and said, I heard that there's a pool that will heal me and cure me. And he went with a plan to be healed and a plan to be cured. But that plan didn't work. And rather than change the plan, he stuck with the plan for 38 years. And he settled for being stuck laying next to his miracle. Many of us today have settled for being stuck because it's better to have a plan even though it doesn't work than to have no plan. And so the Lord shows up in this man's life and he's looking at him and he sees that he's been using the same faulty system. He's been using the same cycle. People that get stuck at a level for too long, eventually you will see that when you're stuck for so long, your desire can dissipate, and now you're doing things to show face like you want the next level, but in your heart, the waters of desire have stopped stirring. That's a good place to clap. Go ahead and clap. I like a church that talks back. The Lord was looking at him and saying, listen, you know what basically Jesus was telling him? Why have you been waiting when you could have been creating? Why are you waiting using the same system to get a breakthrough in your marriage? Why are you waiting using the same system to get a breakthrough in your finances, to get a breakthrough in your character? You're using the same thing for years. And the Lord looks and recognizes the problem. He goes right to the source of the problem and he says, do you even want to get healed anymore? And immediately what Jesus is addressing is he's saying, forget about the waters being stirred and you jumping in. The reason why you're not jumping into the waters when they stir is because the waters of your heart have stopped stirring. And if the desire to get to your greatest level has stopped stirring, then so will the creativity to do something different that you've never done before cease to get you to the next level. See, this is a story about comfort and convenience. This is a story about ease. This is a story about just doing what we've always done. This is a story about laying in between who you were and who you've never been and laying right next to your miracle, right next to your breakthrough, but being unwilling to step out, create something new, birth something new, Forget the past. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. <sighs> See, this is the question that we have to ask ourselves today. Do you even want what you came to Jesus wanting anymore? There's people in here that you wanted God to do a work in your marriage. And now you've settled. You wanted your kids to get saved, and you were vehement about it, but now you've settled because they're older. You wanted a healing in your body, but now you've learned to live with the disease. You've settled. When you came to Jesus, you came for peace. You came for hope. You came for a new life. But things begin to happen as you are waiting in this time of transition. And in the waiting, it has been eating at your desire. And now Jesus is showing up and he's saying, do you even want what you started wanting? Is this too much for Sunday morning? Everybody give me a big smile. Some of you are mad dogging me. Are you hearing me? So Jesus is looking at him and he's telling him, your system is no good. Your cycle is no good. You know what the definition of a cycle is? It's starting to do different things that will always lead you back to the beginning. 
And you know what happens? Many people will give their life to cycles because a cycle can cause you to think that you're doing something new, doing something new, doing something new, and then all of a sudden at the start of the year, you're right back where you started and you're ready for a repeat year. Cycles have kept people busy, but not productive. Are you hearing me today? You see this pool of Bethesda, it's a symbol of the church. This church here, when you come in, the waters are stirring. When you felt the anointing like we felt just a few moments ago and God began to speak and minister to you, that was the Holy Spirit jumping in the pool and stirring the waters. But if the, if the waters of our heart have stopped stirring, then even if the waters stir here every week, you'll leave the same way. See, it's not enough to be a part of a church where the waters stir if the waters have stopped stirring here. You got to look this morning. We got to look. We got to be sick and tired of an old level. We got to be sick and tired of being stuck in certain things. We got to be sick and tired uh, of facing the same barriers. We got to come to this place and say, God, like never before, I want to see these things overcome. Where is your desire? You see, this man here, his condition, it left him three, three ways. First thing is it left him in a place where he was blaming. Well, first of all, let's go before that. The very first response that this man has, the Lord says, do you even want what you have anymore? And what was his response? These people are not helping me. Can you imagine that? So the first thing that we see is that being stuck left this man blaming. So imagine Jesus, he's probably looking at him and he's saying, wait a minute, let me just get this straight here. Let me get a handle on what you're saying. You mean to tell me that you're waiting for these sick people to help you? You're waiting on people who need a breakthrough to help you? You're waiting for people who need a touch from me to help you? Not only are you blaming, but I can see that you're bitter. Being stuck at a level too long will leave you blaming and will leave you bitter. And thirdly, it will leave you blind. The man couldn't even sense that the same one who was stirring the waters was the same one talking to him today. Are you hearing me? Boy, you're scaring me, man. We, we thought you were going to attack me here. But <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for being thoughtful, even though it looked creepy at first. <laughs> Are you hearing me? The Lord is saying this. He's saying, listen. He said, your being stuck has caused you to be a blamer. You are bitter and you are blind. Because you're not even recognizing who it is that you're talking to. It's like the woman with the, at, at the well. When Jesus said, hey, woman, could I have a drink? And she says, what are you doing talking to me? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Why are you talking to me? He says, you're, you're right. He says, now go home to your husband. He says, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd be asking me for a drink. Now go to your husband. She goes, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right, you don't have a husband. But you've been with four other men that aren't your husband. And you don't realize that you're so blind and stuck at the level you've been at. I'm the man you've been waiting for your whole life. You've been searching for love in all the wrong places. And the man you've been dreaming about just showed up and you can't even see it. See, being stuck can cause us to miss God's move. Being stuck can cause us to come into a service where the waters are stirring and walk out the same because we didn't see how God wanted to touch us. Because you came in and you're bitter. You're thinking about these people. You're thinking about that person. You're thinking about what they said. You're thinking about this. You're blaming others. Why did they get the touch? Why did they get the breakthrough? What about me? There's favoritism here. I don't like this and I don't like that. And all that is is a distraction of the enemy. To get us to walk out 
and stay hovering at the same level. Are you hearing me today? You see, this is the time for us to look and say, where is your desire? Let me tell you this. The stirring in our life comes when God is ready to shift things in our life. He stirs before he shifts. Are you hearing me? He stirs before he shifts. And why does he shift? Because he's ready to accelerate. Have you ever driven a stick shift? You know that when you drive a stick shift, you can't accelerate until you shift. You gotta shift out of one gear to the next gear, then you hit the gas. God says, not only am I gonna take you to a greater level, but I'm gonna make up the time that you've wasted being stuck at that level. I'm gonna accelerate you past and faster than you've ever gotten to this level in your life. If you're allowing me to stir you and shift you, I will accelerate. I will raise you up. Are you hearing me today? See, this is the time, but I got news for you. The signature of new birth is discomfort and disruption. Any pregnant women, any women that have had babies can testify to, this, to, to the signature of new birth is discomfort and disruption. Are you hearing me? You ever see a pregnant woman? No matter how she sits, she's never comfortable. No matter how she lays, she's not comfortable. There's discomfort. Why? Because there's new birth in her belly. There's something getting ready to hatch. And some of you are looking for comfort, the comfort that you had in the past. But God says, no, I, I have you in an uncomfortable place because I'm about to birth something brand new in and through your life. So don't look for the comfort. Don't look for the ease. Don't look for the convenience. Embrace the discomfort and know that it's here for a reason. And I'll tell you what, I'm in a place in my life where I've never been this uncomfortable. I've never been this uncomfortable. I've never been this inconvenienced. I've never been this dissatisfied. I've never been in this place. I, I, sometimes, you know, the place of discomfort, it, it, sometimes it doesn't drive you forward. Sometimes it could just drive you to quit. It just make you feel like, you know what, this is not worth it. Maybe I should do something else. See, sometimes we want to settle for something less, acting like what we want and what we're comfortable and what we're used to will actually keep you comfortable. I, I, I remember Pastor Sonny. Pastor Sonny is my pastor and who's been my pastor for my whole life pretty much. And I remember him saying something that he said that sometimes, you know, in, in life, you know, that people are looking for that comfort. They're looking for that convenience. They're looking for those things. He says, but the problem with this generation today, he says, is they want guarantees before they step out by faith. They want to know that everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be provided for. I'm going to be taken care of at this next level. And if everything looks good, I'll step out. God is looking for people that are saying, no, no, no. I'm willing to trust him. I'm, really, I'm willing to believe in him. I'm willing to know that what he has for me is better than what I've always had. Are you hearing me? I, I want this. See, even though I don't know this, have you ever seen somebody that has been so connected to something that is so damaging, but rather than leave it, they stick with it because at least they know it? I've seen people in relationships that were toxic, friendships, boyfriend and girlfriend, relationships that were no good. But at least I know him. I know he beats me, but at least I know him. You don't know him like I know him. And all her friends are saying, leave him. This guy's beating you. He's mistreating you. But you don't understand. You guys don't know him like I know him. No, what you're saying is that I'm comfortable with this. At least I know how to maneuver this. To leave it, I don't know how to maneuver this. Who even knows if I'll have somebody? Who knows if I get someone worse than him? Boy, it got quiet real quick. I'm sorry. I better switch that topic. See, the excuses that we give sometimes to the Lord, 
They define the level and how long we've been waiting and how long and what attitude we've been waiting in. If we're bitter, if we're blind, if we're, if we're, 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 we're numb to the things that God is doing. Listen, this is a time for us to be able to say that, God, I'm ready to surrender because I am no longer catch this this morning. I am willing to let go because I will refuse to use your presence, the church, my relationship with you any longer for relief when you've called me to release. You know what that means? That means that people, you, some of us come in, you know, we got problems, we got things going on in our life. You know what we do? We feel the presence of God show up in a day like today. We feel his power. We feel his anointing. We're all troubled with our own problems and our own circumstances. And you wait for the altar call. You wait for the worship service. You wait for when you feel the anointing. And we come up and we just say, oh, God, here it is, Father. Here it is what I'm going through in my life and in my family and in my, in my character. Here's the situation. Here's how the enemy has been targeting me. Here how he's been attacking me. And you leave it at the altar. And then pastor gets up and says, praise God. Why don't you make your way back to your seat? And right before you go back to your seat, you grab it and you take it back with you. Because you're using the presence of God for relief like, a, like an aspirin. Not like the surgery that some of us need. Some of us need the Holy Ghost surgeon to step into our life and say, I'm not going to medicate this no more. I am trying to heal this. I'm trying to give you, you're trying to settle for medication, and I'm trying to give you a miracle. I'm bringing you here, and, and God is saying this in this time like never before. Hear this and catch this. If you don't release, neither will I. If you don't let go, I can't. Your release is triggering God's release. Why? Because he says, I can't allow you to step foot in your next level. Being the person you are. You have to step foot being who you've never been. If you don't understand that, ask Moses. He said, Moses, here's the promise, son. I have prepared a great land for you. All I need you to do is go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And I just need you to take a two-week journey and you will arrive. And Moses went in and he said, Pharaoh, let my people go. You know why? Because some Christians are really good at getting people delivered. But you don't know how to develop them. Because you have stopped the development in your life. So Moses said, let them go. And Pharaoh, let them go. We all know the story. A two-week journey turned into a 40-year stay. God gave Moses a final attempt to prove his worthiness of the next level. And he says, speak to the rock. And Moses struck the rock in anger. And he said, Moses, because of your anger, you don't get to go in. Why? Why? Because the same anger you hit the rock with is the same anger you killed the Egyptian with 40 years earlier. You thought you were in the desert because the people, you were in the desert because of you. And now you don't get to go to the next level because you're like the people, unwilling to change what I'm trying to change in you. Are you hearing me? This is the time that God is looking and he's saying, listen, I want you to not settle for relief. But let it go. Surrender. Surrender control. Surrender that, that, that feeling. Surrender that bitterness. Surrender that hurt. Surrender that disappointment. Surrender that discouragement. Surrender all those things. Because the Lord is saying... I refuse to medicate you any longer. Boy, it's quiet. Listen to those fans. <laughs> Lastly, we see the miracle working power of Jesus in the story. We've seen that Jesus questioned desire. 
He questioned desire. He, he, he confronted excuses. But now he was ready to perform a miracle. I want you to know that the hallway that you are in of transition is meant to reflect, surrender, shift, change, draw closer to God so we could hear him better and serve him better, develop deeper convictions, make smarter choices, live a holier and transform life. This is a time of our never before, but in order for us to experience this miracle, we have to allow God to speak to the problem. Some of us, we come in church and we want God to speak what we want him to say. And the Lord is saying, I'm not here to speak what you need to hear, what you want to hear. I'm here to address the areas that are creating the problems. When Jesus looked at this man, he looked at him and he heard his excuses. He didn't even pay attention to his excuses. He went right for the problem and he said, pick up your mat and walk. He spoke to the man's life. You know what he was doing? Jesus was telling him this. I'm about to heal you. But as I heal you, I'm demanding that you use your healing for what I have created it for. I'm not going to let you get healed and leave here. I'm demanding action. I'm not going to let you be healed and lay here. No, pick up your mat and walk. It's God's way of saying, I'm going to heal you, but you're going to use your miracle for my honor and glory. Here's another reason. Some of us don't get healed and experience a miracle because we're blind, bitter, and blaming. Some of us don't experience a miracle because you're not interested in using your miracle for him. You just want a better life. You just want to be free of pain. You just want to be blessed financially. You just want to come out from the hole that you're in. And the Lord says, no, 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 that's not how I work. If I heal you, I'm demanding activity and action for the healing that I'm about to give you. You see, today, what is the things that God has been challenging you to give? What has he been challenging you to? For some of you, it's getting involved in ministry. For some of you, it's starting a business. For some of you, it's been getting involved in full-time ministry. For some of you, it's tithing and it's giving to the Lord what belongs to him. For some of you, it's praying for others while you're needing a miracle yourself. For some of you, it's counseling people. For some of you, it's praying more and reading your word more. For some of you, it's different things that God has been saying, I'm stirring your heart. Because I want to use you as a missionary. I'm stirring your heart because I want to use you as a home director. I'm stirring your heart because I'm about to heal you. But when I heal you, you've got to be ready to do something with the healing. That's how churches grow. That's how lives get impacted. Are you hearing me? Jesus is speaking to that area. Come, Anthony. Come join me up here, my brother. Jesus is trying to remake us. But if we don't release what he's asking us to release and don't receive what he's saying, you can't be made, remade in your life. You see, we're living in a time right now. Why do you think the Bible says that when Moses was denied the next level, there was many people, a whole generation died in the desert because he was the leader. He was modeling, not changing. And so a whole generation of people died unchanged. They got out of slavery, but they never got into miracle territory. But God raised up Joshua and Caleb. He raised up people who had a different spirit. He raised up people that were able to come in and say, listen, I've made some adjustments. I've seen what, what others have done, and I've surrendered to God. And if God can do it for them, he can do it for me. I don't want to start where Moses started. I want to start where he ended. I don't want Moses' floor to be my floor. I want his ceiling to be my floor because I want to see God do and continue to do what Moses was not able to do. Today, I ask you this. Why, let me just bring this all home for you. Why am I preaching a message like this? Because this church has great potential. You have great potential. I have great potential. We have greater things to do than we've already done. 
you know why sometimes churches and ministries don't grow at the pace that they could? It's because sometimes the congregation just isn't happy hearing something that gives them relief when God says, I'm calling to you to release so that I can use you to reach more people for my honor and glory. Do you love your church? Well, I better ask that again. Do you love your church? Do you love your Jesus? Do you love your pastors? Then are you willing to let go of what you've been holding on to so that God could use you a little bit greater? I'd like to hear an amen, a clap for that. Yeah. See, this is a message of breakthrough. But before you break through, you got to be broken down so God could break in, so he could break you through. There's a crushing ceremony. There's a crushing that needs to happen this morning. That's what that song is all about. Lord, I'm in between who I was and never been. I'm feeling those growth pains once again. Being torn away from all that has to end. I need you now like I did back then. I need you now. Once again, I can't do it on my own. So I just say, send your revival in this place. Shower down your mercy and your grace. As your children declare our highest praise, we ask you now. To fill this place, we ask you now to show your face. If you're ready to surrender, just stand with me. Lift your hands towards heaven. Call upon him in your own special way right now. Talk to him. Talk to him this morning, talk to him this morning, talk to him. Let him hear your anguish, let him hear your pains, let him hear those things that you've been going through. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father God. There's a thirsting in my soul that never ends. I'm wanting you time and time again. No matter where I start, you're the end. I need you now, like I did back then. 